This is how you ultimately get composability of distinct distributed systems, is you have more expressive systems for interpreting, querying, and just generally using the state of another chain. The Cosmos ecosystem, I think, gets it better than anybody, but it's just a really hard problem. Uh, when you're building a cross-chain transaction in Cosmos, you're, you're most likely using Skip. Bitcoin signing is not the same as Ethereum signing, it's not the same as Solana signing, it's not the same as Cosmos signing, and that causes a massive amount of pain. And that's one of the reasons that the ecosystems are so segmented right now. Welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and people driving decentralization and the blockchain revolution. I'm Friederike Ernst, and today I'll be speaking with Sam Hart, who is the head of product and strategy at Skip, which is a Cosmos-based anti-MEV protocol. We'll get into that in just a bit. Before, let me tell you about our sponsors this week, though. If you're looking to stake your crypto with confidence, look no further than Course One. More than 150,000 delegators, including institutions like BitGo, Pantera Capital, and Ledger, trust Chorus One with their assets. They support over 50 blockchains and are leaders in governance on networks like Cosmos, ensuring your stake is responsibly managed. Thanks to their advanced MEV research, you can also enjoy the highest staking rewards. You can stake directly from your preferred wallet, set up a white label node, restake your assets on Eigenlayer or Symbiotic, or use the SDK for multi chain staking in your app. Learn more at chorus.one and start staking today. This episode is proudly brought to you by Gnosis, a collective dedicated to advancing a decentralized future. Gnosis leads innovation with Circles, Gnosis Pay, and Metri, reshaping open banking and money. With Hashi and Gnosis VPN, they're building a more resilient, privacy-focused internet. If you're looking for an L1 to launch your project, Gnosis Chain offers the same development environment as Ethereum, with lower transaction fees. It's supported by over 200,000 validators, making Gnosis Chain a reliable and credibly neutral foundation for your applications. Gnosis DAO drives Gnosis governance where every voice matters. Join the Gnosis community in the Gnosis DAO forum today. Deploy on the EVM compatible Gnosis Chain or secure the network with just one GNO and affordable hardware. Start your decentralization journey today at Gnosis.io. Hi, Sam. It's a pleasure to have you on. Yeah, great to be here. Long-time listener. <laughs> cool. You have been in this space for a super long time. Um, t tell us about yourself. Yeah, um, I'll give a kind of abridged version, I guess. Um, I started... Uh, my crypto journey, I guess, very close to when Epicenter started. I started listening to Epicenter like quite quite early, um, and uh, I was living in New York City um, right around the time of Occupy Wall Street. So there was kind of like a milieu of, you know, activated political consciousness, and um, uh, I was just kind of bathed in that. And a lot of my friends ended up. Um, participating in Occupy or um, kind of analyzing it from a, a, a more academic or like critical perspective, that got me just very interested in alternative infrastructures for, you know, new institutions effectively. And um, I, I've been in, involved in the arts for my whole life um, and ended up doing a lot of kind of critical art projects or like interventionist projects around that or met a bunch of people that were involved in Occupy and like doing both of these things. Um, and uh, eventually, um, I, I have a technical background. I worked as a um, research scientist for, for 10 years um, doing protein folding and bioinformatics work. Uh, so I was able to kind of like bridge the gap and um, some of these folks who were interested in kind of rebuilding institutions, ended up getting into crypto unknowingly, and um, and I could kind of provide like a technical basis for some of that, and just got really fascinated by the, the industry. Um, made, kind of got pulled into it um, accidentally, and uh, it's been, you know, a, a very interesting journey ever since. Um, I did, I've done a whole bunch of consulting projects with 
Ethereum protocols and Cosmos protocols kind of all over the place. Uh, a lot of kind of product strategy, brand strategy, mechanism design, um, I've kind of ghost written or, or helped write a whole bunch of white papers. Um, and then that ended up bringing me to Berlin at one point to work with a, a project here now called Radical. Um, so it's like an open source um, or like decentralized GitHub alternative. Um, so finished the contract with them, worked on EIP-1559 a little bit um, as a kind of uh, you know, one of the many members who were, played a small role. And eventually the, the pandemic started. Um, the, I, I didn't want to be living abroad doing freelance work. So um, one of my closest friends, Billy Renekamp, uh, was working in Cosmos at the at All In Bits, um, kind of a defunct organization now. It, it kind of liquidated um, at the time. And most of the engineers moved to the Interchain Foundation, kind of primary foundation associated with Cosmos. Um, he asked me if I wanted to join and kind of rebuild the Cosmos ecosystem. Um, so I spent about two years there um, and you know made a lot of progress in reforming the the kind of meta organization that built all the technology. Did kind of wore all hats there, so I did kind of product strategy and a, a bunch of like deeper product work with for like the whole stack. Um, and then, uh, yeah, a whole bunch of kind of BD, yeah, lots of backend work. And then um, last thing I did there was work on the Atom 2, Atom 2.0 paper, which was kind of a, a, a beautiful failure. Um, and uh, at that point, I had just kind of like touched every part of the part of the ecosystem. I was like, okay, I need to need to take a break. Need to do something else. Um, I uh, completely failed at taking a break. I ended up joining <laughs> Skip immediately afterwards, as well as uh, co-founding this other project, um, Time Wave, which builds this protocol, protocol lending product product, which is kind of a something that merged and an idea that emerged out of the Atom 2 initiative. Um, and yeah, I'm happy to talk about either of those, those things today. Um, I guess that was a little bit of a longer intro than I anticipated. Yeah, Sam, it sounds like you're one, one person startup. I mean, uh, you've, you've basically touched uh, on all the different aspects, kind of like from white paper to kind of, uh, uh, tech stack to um, company structuring and governance and uh, BD and branding. Did they meet any other people at IBC at all? Um, yeah, I mean, there were a lot of other people at, at BSCF, <laughs> um, but there, there were not as many people who had that kind of like broad context. And I mean, I'm sure you're, you know, Gnosis has a similar just kind of latitude in like the number of things that you're doing, right? Like how deep you have to go. And there there are, I think there are these specific people that like have that full view and like that's super, super valuable to just like kind of understand how the pieces interlock with one another. Absolutely. You have a fairly eclectic background, right? Kind of you talked about kind of like arts and biochemistry and protein folding and so on. How do you how do you decide what to work on? I mean, wh 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 what what does a project actually have to have in order to appeal to you? Yeah, wow, that's a that's a great question. I I'm not sure I do decide. It it's like decided for me. Like they come I, to you. <laughs> well, no, I just like kind of follow my interests. Like that that's really been like my guiding light. Is like I kind of can't not work on this thing. It's it, I'm just kind of drawn to it. Um which has just brought me into some very circuitous paths and and a whole bunch of different things but i'm yeah i'm just like a very curious person and then kind of follow that follow that line um it, it is kind of funny because i do play like a strategy role in a lot of these instances which is like very much 
a kind of structure or it has this kind of structured unstructured aspect to it where you know given your position in the market and like what you're trying to achieve what do you what are you trying to do but like for my personal life i'm just very like okay yeah, i'm gonna float wherever is just kind of most attractive yeah super nice um you also um you're also part of the other internet um which is a super interesting research um collective um whose uh outputs i consume uh with uh some frequency they're 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 usually very insightful can can you talk about that and kind of we'll also link to that in the show notes because i think it's it's underappreciated in the ecosystem yeah absolutely um it's a very special group of people and organization you know pretty pretty unique in in the space um and uh it, it, it i mean it is a research organization kind of cultural research um we do a variety of things. Um, some of it is kind of these long form kind of cultural analysis or kind of contemporary anthropologies of what's happening in crypto. Um, some of it is consulting work. So worked with Uniswap and Aragon and Optimism and a whole bunch of other folks, um, mostly on kind of governance and uh, I don't know, kind of community development. Um, projects and then um there's uh there's kind of an internal side of the organization which most most people don't know about which is uh really about um kind of personal development and and learning so there's like a reading group and and we we've done seminars like brought in lectures to like just speak to the group about topics that we're interested in um a lot of like political philosophy and uh, I don't know, practitioners that were doing, uh, you know, work with municipal governments and things, things like that. So it, it's a, it, it's also, you know, houses a, a, a bunch of folks that have pretty eclectic interests and, you know, has a, a multitude of different projects that kind of reflect their skill sets and, and where they're drawn to as well. Yeah, no, it's it's a it's a great resource. Uh, go check it out, people. So let's talk about Skip Protocol. So um, you are the head of product and strategy um, there. How how would you describe Skip in a few sentences? Yeah, um, and it, it's maybe a little bit different than how you kind of introduced introduced Skip in in the intro, um, which is totally understandable. The organization's evolved a lot. Um, and it, it definitely started out as like a MEV infrastructure company, um, had product very similar to the, like the Flashbots MEV relay. Um, but uh, today, like, basically what we realized is that like MEV is not really a product. It's, it's more of a phenomenon or, you know, maybe a business model if you're oh, probably. Uh, kind of structuring it. Or problem totally. Um, it's a it's a force to be reckoned with. It, it's also kind of a a lens that you can bring to product development. So that that's kind of how we approach things today. Um, the first thing that we realized was, okay, if we're going to be like a cross chain MEV organization, or if that's something that that we're interested in, we need to have more cross-chain economic activity happening. So like we, we just started working on that problem. Like it's actually really hard to do. Um, and it's completely, it, it's unsolved today. Like there are, you know, domains or like coverage areas where you can get a decent experience, but it's really, uh, if you kind of deviate from, from that path, it's an absolute nightmare. Um, so uh, we started in j just kind of solving that for Cosmos, um, have done a whole bunch of kind of full stack modifications of the, the mempool, the fee market, the um, IBC, the interoperability protocol, like just basically every layer of the stack to kind of try to smooth out that experience. A lot of that work kind of focused on transaction building or, or it, 
it, it was in order to deliver an experience that was that was kind of close to the user. Um, we also, uh, in order to kind of make this experience seamless, we we also needed to to work on the the kind of node architecture itself. Um, Cosmos is a, a network of sovereign app which, app chains, so. Um, we built a, a fee market. We we built a kind of transaction builder that's internal to the to deployed nodes. And um, what we realized there is that um, a, a lot of that work um, looked a lot like an oracle of some kind. So we kind of evolved that product suite into um, an enshrined oracle um, that. Uh, many app chains in in the ecosystem are using, including DYDX and um, Neutron and others. Um, and we're kind of syndicating that and and deploying it more widely now. So the the kind of unifying umbrella there is we're basically building tools for sovereign chains and um, trying to kind of pick off the the problems that are you know most important to to builders. Um, and there's a whole bunch of things that we we want to do in the future to to improve that experience and make it really easy to to deploy your own app chain. Just in case that hasn't become abundantly clear, you guys are on Cosmos. So um, why was interoperability a problem before? Kind of like because Cosmos is very much devised with kind of like this interoperability um, mindset, um, you know. To- front and center. So I mean, kind of like IBC is kind of like the the cool thing um, for Cosmos, right? Totally. I mean, IBC, the Cosmos ecosystem, I think, gets it better than anybody, but it's just a really hard problem. Um, first of all, like, what does interoperability even mean? Like, what is and who is who or what is interoperable with, you know, with what? Um, you're working in a a kind of network of networks, you know, it, it's a distributed system that has heterogeneous architecture. Um, the what IBC gives you is a standard message passing system and way of a, of kind of creating like an assurance around the um, the like who your counterparty is by like having the chain itself authenticate messages. And that's kind of it, actually. Like that's that's the core of what IBC is. It's actually just kind of like a natural solution. Like, oh, you don't want to introduce a third party when chains are talking to each other. That's kind of the core thesis. And then there's you can build other things on top of that. Um, so you can build a fungible to- token protocol, an NFT protocol, a kind of remote access or re- remote authentication protocol. So even just in the the fungible token case. Um, because IBC is a point-to-point messaging system, it, its security uh, kind of relies on, or or it assumes that you don't want to introduce third party, like you want to direct communicate directly. Basically, means that um, you can't just send a token directly to any chain at any time um, and have it uh, produce the the correct representation. Um, so. Uh, you typically need to unwind tokens through their their issuer, their, their issuing chain. Um, so we're we're now getting like, you know, if I want to uh, send my atom from neutron to osmosis, I actually need to send it back to the Cosmos Hub, and then I need to send it um, to osmosis. And there's three different chains, three different distributed systems like involved here. You're actually creating a workflow between between these things that's completely asynchronous. Um, so the, there ends up being these kind of middlewares that you uh, that you deploy on a chain in order to interpret messages in order to like forward them on to the next um, to the next node domain. That's just for fungible tokens, which is like very kind of structured process. If you want to do anything more complicated than that, like you want to compose the application behavior of three different protocols, um, this is going to get way more complicated. And this is one of the reasons that we kind of went in this Oracle direction as well as, okay, you want to dynamically read state from a different chain and then, you know, be able to, you know, like this is how you ultimately get composability of distinct distributed systems is you have 
more expressive systems for interpreting, querying, um, and you know, just generally using the the state of another chain. Yeah. <laughs> Long story short, it's just a really hard problem, um, and we've thought really deeply about it, but it, it's about the most challenging thing that you could possibly uh, approach in, in order to get like really good composability um, at that like application level. But Cosmos was kind of devised in this application chain um, architecture. Um, so so how, how did things work? work before Skip, or what were the things that very concretely you added to kind of help devs um, cross that bridge? Yeah, I think it's just a, the difference is kind of like the theoretical versus the practical. Um, we were really the first team that was um, kind of serving multiple customers with that specific agenda of like, oh, we, we want to make these flows better. Um, Osmosis was, you know, kind of a power user of IBC, but their their workflow is just kind of like drawing assets in, right? Like it's kind of one way flow, and they can kind of simplify what they need to do. Uh, we're kind of serving all chains at once, and so we need these, you know, much more intricate di dynamic flows to be available. The problem that we ended up solving first was. Um, just how do you build a transaction? Like, yes, it's technically possible to build a transaction that's going to have this behavior, but the <laughs> the practical reality of that is like, okay, well, you need to uh, understand what the fee token of this of the counterparty chain or all of the intermediate chains are. Um, you need to understand uh, what kind of fee market they have. They might have different fee markets. Um, you need to understand uh, what the fallback behavior is if something doesn't get executed. Um, there's just like all of this information and context, like what the token denominations are, what are the signature schemes that each of these chains have. Um, there's actually, a, even though something's technically possible, just performing the right sequence of actions is is immensely difficult. So that was kind of the first thing we solved is just um, we have a, an API that does transaction building and delivers that to a, a wallet or a front end. Um, so we power a lot of the um, the transaction building in, in the ecosystem cross chain. And uh, who, who are your users for this API service? Most of the major front ends in Cosmos and, and uh, a bunch of the or main wallets. So um, Kepler, Leap, uh, there's a, a MetaMask extension that uses uh, uses Skip. Uh, and then um, Osmosis, Neutron, um, DYDX. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's the main way that you get around. It's, it's a little bit hidden in the background, but uh, when you're building a cross-chain transaction in Cosmos, you're, you're most likely using Skip. I should also mention we're not Cosmos uh, specific per se. Like we kind of extended into, so Cosmos technology is extended into a whole bunch of different domains, and then we've also kind of adopted some other bridges. So we we're actually the we do the most volume, or like we're one of the only providers that's able to do uh, CCTP transactions between uh, different chains. We actually there are routes that are non-Cosmos that we, we serve um, were one of the best ways to, to do any kind of hyperlane transaction. Um, we're working with a bunch of Bitcoin L2s and, and things like this. So we're, uh, we're just kind of going where, uh, I guess the, the kind of territory that we're, or our coverage areas uh, continuing to increase uh, as we see demand for these things. So CCTB uh, being the sucker uh, protocol, yeah. right? Okay. For for devs or projects that kind of use your service, um, how how do they how do they pay? So is it kind of like on a transaction basis, or how do they pay for your service? Service. Yeah. So our two main products right now are this Oracle um, service, and um, we have a the API. 
and there's uh, there's kind of a structure or like a semi-structured model for um, for payment in, on both sides. Um, it's a little bit dependent on the nature of what you want to do. So there's there's a number of like special cases, and and we do a bunch of like kind of custom work for for folks like you know DYDX. We did like a ton of custom work to get exactly where they wanted to go. Uh, on the Oracle side, we have a um, like service contracts, your yearly service contracts, which is a kind of standard um, Oracle model. Uh, and then on um, on the the API side, um, uh, Skip Go is is the name of the API. We take a percentage of the fees taken by the um, by the affiliate. So um, if you're not charging, then uh, we won't take a cut, um, but if you are charging, then um, then we'll take a percentage of that. Okay. And the oracles um, that you are offering to kind of enable this interoperability or the seamless interoperability, um, what kind of oracles are they? Are they kind of decentralized or are they kind of just feeds that you pull from somewhere and uh, put on chain? Maybe just worth backing up for a second. Like, what what is a Cosmos chain? So um, it's a delegated proof of stake chain. Uh, that is run by, you know, typically anywhere from twenty to a hundred validators, and uh, the Oracle system that we develop um, is integrated into the binary and and the validator setup. So all of the val- all the validators are running the Oracle. There is a a note uh, a module in the. Um, in the binary that does some interpretation of, of incoming messages. And um, and then there's a sidecar process that's run by each validator that will query um, uh, a, v- a variety of providers. Uh, and those providers are can be programmed by the, the application chain. So um, DYDX, for instance, uses primarily price feeds, um, but from a number of different providers. Uh, so for any asset, it will want multiple providers. Um, some of those might be it might be Uniswap, um, so it could just query chain state directly. Um, it could include proofs of of that chain state if it, if it wanted to, um, or it could be Binance, um, Coinbase. It can aggregate um, locally on the validator, um, and then uh, the validator, as part of its uh, kind of consensus voting process, uh, submits its aggregated. Um, aggregated price or ag- aggregated data, uh, and then the uh, the chain then does a second aggregation to um, find a, a consensus value for whatever state you're trying to uh, to include in in the application. So it's an Oracle aggregator protocol in a way. Is that fair to say? Yeah, I, I think that's fair. Um, kind of all oracles are oracle aggregators to some extent. They don't. It, it's a little bit of like a backend detail, but any decentralized feed is, is some kind of aggregation. Um, that's fair. Yeah. Yeah. The, the main differentiator is it's there's there's no middleman. Like e- even Skip is not a middleman in this process. It's just it is run by the validators and the chain. They are fetching the data, and then it is like you come to consensus on the data. So Skip develops a a module that you can you can run and then we you know we're we're kind of on hand for maintenance and and things of that that nature, but um we're not running an intermediary service. Why did I think that you guys primarily do MEV, like cross chain MEV? I mean we did at, at one point. Um I guess there's a question of like what what even is MEV, but um, I guess we're more on the MEV generation than MEV uh, extraction side now. We we have developed a number of products that that had this character. Um, uh, we've open sourced all of them, um, and they are in production. So uh, the first one that we developed was a product for Osmosis, which was a um, Again, it was a module that lives inside the binary of, of the Osmosis chain. It's live today, and uh, it automatically backruns um, 
transactions in, in order to it, it does cyclic arbitrage uh, kind of before a um, a searcher is able to um, to extract that revenue. This is something before we did this, like people didn't think was possible. So it was, it was kind of cool to to demonstrate that the, it's viable to actually do solving like in protocol. Um, it, it's been really interesting to see this is kind of like rebranded as the application specific sequencing now. Um, but yeah, if you want to see an example of that, it's live on Osmosis. Uh, it was a little bit Osmosis specific, so we, it was kind of a one-off. Um, we also developed another product called the Block SDK, um, which is uh, also deployed in a number of chains in Cosmos. Um, what the Block SDK does is it allows you to create programmable lanes for your block space. Uh, so you can say, basically, you create different kind of me sub mempools. Um, and then different block building rules uh, for each of those mempools. Um, and so you can have different kind of, basically transactions come into the main mempool. Uh, there's kind of a hierarchical um, filter in which they get sorted into different these different mempools. Uh, and then you can program, program them to do whatever they want. So uh, some, you could have a free lane for instance, just transactions of this type are are free, uh, or they're free up to a, a certain number per hour or something like that. Transactions that are from this user or from a user that has this NFT, you know, have a reduced rate. You know, you can you can kind of do whatever you want here. Um, so uh, we've seen you know a bunch of creativity kind of applied to to that system. Um, again, we had to kind of build that system to realize like. I mean, these maybe not like a business model um, so much as like a uh, a tool, and um, so we just open sourced that product and and you know have helped a, a bunch of people to to integrate it, deploy it, give them some advice on how to use it. But um, it's it's just kind of freely available for the ecosystem. I mean, has caused a large amount of controversy um, in in the Ethereum ecosystem. Um, how um, how has that gone down in the Cosmos ecosystem? Was it equally um, contentious? No, um, I mean for a couple of reasons. Like one, <laughs> there's just way less uh, economic activity in the Cosmos ecosystem. Um, so MEV is going to occur when there's a high degree of, you know, when there is value to be extracted and when there's a lot of contentious state and cosmos kind of has its general like architecture is one of less contentious state you know you're separating applications into their own domains and there's less economic value um currently so um that both of those together mean that the kind of severity of um mev uh, and some, it's just something that's like way less of a dire issue. Um, it's still there, and it's still something you want to address and and kind of give give attention to. But it, it's more of a, a background thing, and again, more of like a lens or toolkit to 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 bring to a, a problem. Yeah, ju just as a background, kind of like on Ethereum. Um, there were times when you know one percent or so of total value transacted was um, extracted. Do you have an idea of what the equivalent percentage is on Cosmos? I don't. I mean, it's so small that it like wasn't worth tracking. Like that, that's kind of what we're talking about here. Um, it also it a little bit depends on what you're talking about with MEV. So the cyclic arbitrage that we're now doing in protocol for osmosis, that was the largest source of MEV in the like ecosystem. Like backrunning, right? Backrunning. Backrunning on osmosis. Backrunning on, OK. That's super interesting. Um, that because, made up like 90% yeah. of, of MEV. That is now being captured by the protocol. Is that MEV? I Like, the protocol is capturing it. Yeah, th that doesn't matter. So basically, to me, MEV is, is everything that kind of um, 
where where kind of you can extract value or something can extract value um, by changing the context of the transaction. Um, and you do it, you're very much doing it, But it's not minor it, right? extractable value. The protocol is extracting it. It doesn't matter. Uh, this is what I'm saying. The, the, the definition here is, uh, is relevant. I mean, it's, are you familiar with MEV blocker? Uh, yeah. 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 So kind of like it's, it's a protocol that we built on, on Ethereum and, uh, uh, basically, it it also it does the same. So kind of like it it prevents front running and sandwiching, and it uh, it kind of gives back ninety percent of the fees that are accrued through back running, I should say. And I mean back running to to kind of to to give a very simple explanation here for back running. It's kind of like, um, for instance, if you change the price of something on chain by your own transaction, and then kind of there's there's a value in kind of bringing that back to where it should be. And that's kind of backgrounding. So kind of in a way, it's kind of benign MEV and that kind of like no nothing is being extracted from you. You're just not a very sophisticated trader. And that kind of like s someone would have would have upped that anyway and kind of like, uh, yeah. Um, and we actually on Ethereum, we see that uh, that um, uh, backgrounding is uh, a fairly minor percentage of of uh, uh, MEV. Why, why do you think it's different on on Cosmos. Um, why is back running specifically a, a smaller percentage? Um, yeah. So why 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 is it a much bigger? So comparatively, a much bigger issue on Osmosis than on on uh, Ethereum. Oh well, you're just saying the distribution between um, top of block or or stat arb and back running. I mean, the reason is like really stupid, which is that. Like Ethereum, <laughs> Ethereum has more tokens that are listed on Binance, so the you can do stat arb between Binance and Ethereum, and there's just <laughs> like less tokens that are listed on centralized exchanges. In okay. Cosmos. Yeah, there is stat arb, and and I think it's like increasing over time, but um, yeah, it, it's a really trivial answer. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's that's fair. What do you think of protocols that kind of like prevent? MEV completely. So, for instance, there's Shutter, right? Kind of that kind of um, that encrypts your your transactions before they're sent um, to the mempool, and then it kind of it decrypts them only once they've been included in a block. Um, do Do you think that would be a good technical solution to kind of uh, just completely do away with the problem? Yeah. So, completely is a strong word. Um, so we we worked with Osmosis on like an early version of of their threshold decryption thing, which which has not been deployed yet. It's been, um, but they you know helped to kind of initiate that idea. Um, so we we've done quite a bit of like research on this topic. Um, one of the reasons it hasn't been deployed is it kind of only becomes an issue at a certain level of of. MEV that you might be concerned about. Okay, I, it, this is a it's a tool. It really depends on yeah. what you're trying to do. Um, so in the Ethereum context, like as far as I understand, Shutter is like trying to do something for main chain, right? Like yeah, it's live on Gnosis chain right now. Um, uh, but kind of like yeah, obviously, kind of like uh, th there are discussions whether to also deploy it on mainnet. But it's like the the beacon, you know. That's kind of where it's targeting, which is, uh, you know, ha has like this high degree of composability. There's lots of contention. This is a so like that is a different environment than one in which you're just doing like a ticketing app or whatever, and like there's maybe not a lot of MEV and like so the way that it's going to behave, the incentives for kind of like you know the way that you break this thing is you. Uh, you go into the like collocation, and um, you try to to deliver transactions or, or get information as as quickly as possible from like a, a third party exchange. Um, I think that all the more economic activity you have, like the more you're going to be pushed in that direction. It's a little bit of a cat and mouse game on how to how to ameliorate that, but deployed in an environment. Like like ticketing app, for instance, like maybe it's just not even worth 
like doing that whole thing and you're just never going to have that kind of behavior. And so it, it could just be fine. Like it could be a nice thing that's like out of the box for a system like that and just eliminate some behaviors that were like kind of easy to do previously. And that's just like that class of whatever searcher is just like never going to exist because they're not, you know, getting the $10 on the, the like advanced ticket is like not worth, you know, co- co-locating a, in a data center in Japan. Like, yeah, that's fair. Um, can we talk, can we zoom out a little bit and kind of like talk about the Ethereum versus Cosmos debate? Because kind of like you've, you've been kind of like in this ecosystem a super long time. And as you say, there's way less economic activity on Cosmos, but Cosmos does have this kind of like um, inbuilt interoperability, which now thanks to Skip, um, maybe it's also usable and kind of like, wh- why Why do you think um, Ethereum sees so much more economic activity where kind of interoperability is much more, um, is much more an afterthought um, for us? And I mean, we've, we've seen this over the past two and a half years or so, right? Kind of like we've had four and a half billion in bridge hacks. <laughs> so wh- wh- why, wh- I mean, fr- from kind of like, a first principles approach the cosmos ecosystem yeah m- makes a lot of sense right <laughs> well why is it co- why is cosmos less successful um there's there's a bunch of reasons some of them are um are very like circumstantial and path dependent i mean the main development organization completely melted down and fragmented into now like 10 different or entities which is very interesting super decentralized ecosystem like maybe this is not a consensus opinion but i think this was actually really good for the cosmos ecosystem because kind of like the the i mean uh all in bits and kind of like the leadership everything was a little bit dysfunctional it was kind of like i think kind of like having that fall apart um I think that was a really good thing for the ecosystem. Would would, would you would you see this otherwise? I mean, I don't I don't think it's black or white. Like it was good for some things, it was bad for others. Like if you want Adam token number to go up, probably bad for that. Like, but uh, it did allow for just a a lot of like, kind of all of these fragmented entities like started their own thing. And so there was just like a, you know, there was a lot of creativity that was kind of brought into, into other projects. Um, This is one of the, this is one of the reasons it's really fun to work in Cosmos is like, it really is kind of a bastion of like new ideas and you get to try stuff out. I mean, I've worked on like the very beginning of proof of stake, the very beginning of liquid staking, the very beginning of restaking, the very beginning of like, uh, you know, just, this a lot of this MEV stuff that we're now talking about. Um and it's cool to talk to Ethereum people and be like, oh yeah, like I did that. And like we we explored all these different ideas and like it's actually a really nice dialogue to be able to have have some of that experience. But yeah, I mean it impacted the go to market for the primary asset for sure. I, I think the the architecture uh, you know ma- doing a doing one chain it's easier. It's just, it's just easier to, to do. And like, um, to bring that to market, to create a unified experience around it in order to kind of get initial traction, um, causes never had that. So it was like always dealing with the, the problems that were anticipated for, you know, a market that was several years down the line. And now it's nice to have them. Um, but yeah, it was a little bit like cart before the horse, maybe. I I do think Ethereum would have done well to have more of an emphasis on interoperability from the beginning. It's like very hard to back into that because they're competing solutions. Nobody's incentivized to use something that's invented today or, or kind of like forced in by, you know, but Ethereum foundation leadership. Yeah, I mean, a lot of it is just kind of like a cultural or like normative thing where you think about the ecosystem as one 
that has interoperability or like that's that's kind of a core asset like everybody's just like, yeah i use that that's my default and that helps a lot yeah so i totally i totally agree that it's kind of like it's to do with kind of like standard setting so kind of like on ethereum we kind of we know what the fee market is like and uh, um and yeah this is by, by by the flip side interoperability is kind of like was underspecified in kind of like uh, the the protocol um ex ante um we do see a lot of interesting solutions, though. Do you think they will reach um, the same level of security as IBC eventually? Uh, I, I, I guess I just see them a little bit as like apples and oranges, like the whole security model is just different. Um, it's different, yeah. There is a an assumption that you're using Ethereum for quote unquote settlement. You know, the market maker is taking on the risk of settlement oftentimes in these like fast transfer systems. IBC is just like more of a standard, standardized process. Um, yeah, I, it's a little bit hard to, to answer that question because they're, they're kind of different animals. So in Ethereum, you can like reason about Ethereum security, but you, every single bridge has a different, is different. It's like its own snowflake, which is, kind of messed up, to be honest. Um, and then there's all these different fast transfer or uh, kind of slow transfer settlement processes that you can you can take. And there's heterogeneous messaging and heterogeneous like uh, authentication. And in Cosmos, there's heterogeneous security, there's heterogeneous domains, but like standardized messaging, which is kind of the inverse. Yeah, it's, it's a to totally different uh, system do 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 you see applications working cross ethereum and cosmos in due time so kind of like when i talk about kind of like um actual user adoption kind of like having numis use things that are powered by blockchain infrastructure um i usually posit that kind of no one will have to know um what's kind of powering the application that they're using do you envision there kind of being um this Cross ecosystem um, operability, where kind of like I can send things from uh, Ethereum to Cosmos or messages, or kind of like ha have kind of flit between the two of them without knowing that I'm currently doing that, without with that kind of being totally abstracted away from me. Yeah, ab absolutely. Um, I mean, it's already happening in certain in, in many cases. So, first of all, it depends on what you call Cosmos, um, to some extent. I'm not sure we want to get into this, but like Cosmos is both a, um, you know, an ecosystem. There's the Cosmos hub, which has an asset, um, which is like pretty distinct in a lot of ways from the ecosystem. There's a stack of components, uh, that many of these, um, that many of these projects are building with. Um, and then I, I also like to say that there's kind of a, the stack you can even kind of decompose into like a set of specific components, you know, the Cosmos SDK, Comet, IBC, and then just like a general pattern of like, okay, there's a state machine framework, there's a consensus algorithm and there's a message passing system. And like that, that kind of looks like, you know, the jam stack or something like that. It's just like, that's a pattern that's like adopted everywhere. Um, but Th those specific components are actually all over the place. E even in a lot of Ethereum projects, you just kind of don't hear about them. It's just they're yeah. useful tools. So is that like Cosmos interoperability? Like maybe I, you know, I talk to a lot of Ethereum projects that are like, they want to use the Cosmos SDK for this random thing. Like, yeah, happy to talk to you. Like it can do X, Y, Z. User never knows, you know, it's like the same signing algorithm um it it just does what you want it to do under the hood um comet similarly is used all over the place um in a bunch of ethereum projects and elsewhere um one thing that's been very interesting is that um restaking projects are use using the cosmos the cosmos stack um in in a number of different places i think it might be the most popular restaking architecture. Um, it's kind of that and the OP stack seem, seem to be uh, used most frequently. 
Um, but it's not branded as such, you know, it's just, oh yeah, it's like deploy an AVS, but you're like using the Cosmos SDK and Comet and maybe even IBC in some instances. So um, that interop is already kind of happening. We just, it's a little bit more under the hood. The things that are most annoying are signing. And this is, this is a, just a general issue across like Bitcoin signing is not the same as Ethereum signing is not the same as Solana signing is not the same as uh, Cosmos signing. And um, that causes a massive amount of pain. And that's one of the reasons that the ecosystems are so segmented right now, in my opinion, is um, means you have different wallet ecosystems, you have different, um, the, the, the kind of front door for users ends up being different. Um, so signing abstractions like MPC style protocols, I think are going to be, um, you know, important for like solving, solving things at that layer, but that's going to take a long time to, to transition beyond that. Uh, there are different message passing systems. There are different middlewares for, um, for routing messages, um, between different domains. There are different you know, you have to pay with different fees. Uh, so that kind of all these things need to be solved together in order to get, uh, user flows that are, that are really seamless. Uh, it's happening though. I mean, and like I was saying at the beginning, there are specific routes today that cross multiple different chains, multiple different ecosystems, and they're, they're great. They, they work, they work great. Um, it, it's just going to take a while to kind of like expand that to the point where it really feels seamless everywhere. Can you give examples of where you think it feels seamless now? Yeah, I'm, so you can go from um, Solana. Uh, if you have USDC on Solana and you want to send it to Osmosis and buy whatever, Osmo, you can do that in one click. Um, and it, it's very fast. Um, that's, that's, that's cool. Um, uh, so CCP opened up a lot of uh, a lot of these routes for us. We are working on a, a fast transfer system that's going to allow for similar interoperability between um, some Ethereum domains and uh, and Cosmos. Uh, we also work with a bunch of the like roll up ecosystem um, or modular ecosystem. So um, we've been doing. Uh, I mean, similarly, you could go from base to um, to a rollup that's using a hyperlane bridge um, in one click um, today, and fitting all the the pipes together to make that work is was pretty crazy. But like, and and you might end up with a in an account that ha that requires a different wallet at the end. Like that's kind of annoying, but. Um, you can't actually send the transaction or send the tokens and have them arrive at the at the other side. So, do you see Skip kind of going the this multi-chain route, kind of in kind of making things easier for devs? Because kind of like as you explain, kind of currently this is primarily on Cosmos only. Do you intend to kind of expand into this cross-chain world? Uh, yeah. I mean, I, I would say we're already kind of expanded. Um, it, it's just going to be incremental. Um, so we are working with a number of restaking projects or folks that are using Cosmos SDK in, in different domains. We're, we're actually even integrating with non Cosmos projects like, like our, um, uh, or projects that aren't using the, uh, using Cosmos technology. So we're looking at shared sequencers, for instance, and just deploying our, um, our sidecar process uh, in order to um, feed Oracle messages directly into the sequencer. And there actually isn't Cosmos SDK necessarily involved at all. Um, so yeah, there's diff different kind of levels of an interop here. And um, uh, I, I mean, one of the challenges is just kind of knowing where to put your emphasis because um, things kind of go in all directions. Um, so. There's a lot of people who are using the technology in one way or, or another, and um, you know, we're trying to see which way is the wind's blowing and, and how that kind of aligns with our, 
with our business and and who we want to develop relationships with. So what would you say, how, how is the wind blowing right now? So what's what's uh, in the pipe for Skip? Um, well, a couple of things. Um, first of all, we, we're like constantly just doing a lot of work on the core stack. And so we're we're doubling down on that. Um, Cosmos SDK has a ton of adoption uh, and we want to be um, we want it to be better, want, want it to be easier to deploy. Um, we want it to just be more standardized and um, just le less sharp edges. So that, that's some, something that we're working on. And then there are a bunch of users uh, of the technology that um, that we're that we want to work with or are working with. Um, like I said, restaking projects are is just a natural fit for us. Um, we would also love to see more projects deployed um, directly into, you know, using the technology alone. Um, one one thing that's like a little bit of a contrarian take that we have, I have, I guess, is um, proof of authority is like totally under leveraged. Um, when we've used it in certain instances and. Uh, worked with projects using a POA chain. It's actually really nice and kind of, yeah. I mean, it's like a it's a great deployment loop. Um, and for a lot of use cases, I think it's it's absolutely secure enough. It's absolutely like decentralized enough. It, there's just a lot of like low security or like thing. And there's all a lot of ways to enhance a, a POA system, um, particularly with restaking and things like this. So. Um, so that would be a way that, you know, that could be like a new market that, that could open up. And yeah, like I mentioned, the uh, shared sequencers is, is something that we're kind of exploring at the moment, um, integrating our, our Oracle into that. Uh, these Bitcoin L2s are like really heterogeneous in what they offer. Um, but we're, uh, there are a few projects that are, are a natural fit and, and we're starting to, to work with them. Yeah, super interesting. Looking forward to seeing that. Where can people find out more about Skip? Yeah, so we just uh, did kind of a rebrand and changed our URL. So it's skip.build. Um, and the uh, the Twitter handle or the X handle is, is still at Skip Protocol. Perfect. Super nice. It's been a pleasure, Sam. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you for having me. This was great.